On Sunday morning, we're going through the book of Romans. We started in chapter 1. The title of our series is The Problem Solved, as we're looking at the problem that we are all born into. It's what the Bible calls sin. And uh, Romans, the, the entire book of Romans, is, a, is an incredible explanation of the human condition and God's solution for it. So we called our series The Problem Solved. So we spent time talking about the, the, the nature of mankind as we've gone through Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3 and seen that no one is good, no one is good, no one is good. But then as we get now into Romans 7 and 8, uh, we are learning about the Christian life. And specifically with Romans chapter 8, which is one of the most incredible chapters in all of the Bible. Romans chapter 8 talks about life in the Spirit. If you're a Christian here, I don't know if you realize this, but when you came to know Christ, the Holy Spirit of God came to dwell within you. You're a spiritual creature. You're going to live forever. And so, so what does life look like when you have God's Holy Spirit living within you? That's what we're looking at uh, in Romans chapter 8. Uh, last week, and I just want to mention this because the, the first part of Romans 8, we're taking three weeks to go through the entire chapter, but last week we talked about freedom. And not freedom like we typically think about, you know, living in the USA and all of that, although I'm more than anyone am thankful for this country. Uh, but we talked about spiritual freedom, specifically freedom from condemnation. And this is an important one. Freedom from control of sin in our lives. We are, freedom from, we are free from sin's control. And then uh, we ended the message last week talking about freedom from fear. Uh, so today, uh, moving on as we look at verses 18 to 30, I'd like to talk about victory. So this is part two of Romans chapter 8. Uh, life in the Spirit is a life of victory. So we'll look at Romans 18 to 30. Uh, to begin, though, I'd like to read uh, the first uh, several verses here. We'll read from verse 18 to 25. Uh, and then uh, we'll pray and we'll take a closer look at that. I'm reading from the New Living Translation just to make some of the incredible deep theological truths a little bit easier to understand. If you have a different translation, that's cool. Just try to follow along the best you can. Uh, verse 18, Romans chapter 8, it says, Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan. Even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. Let's pray. Father, with Bibles opened, I pray that our hearts would be opened as well as we come to your word today. Lord, we're here today because we need you. We're here today because we recognize that life should not be lived alone. And we desperately want to live our lives in alignment with the truth of your word. So we ask you to speak to us today. Lord, I pray you would give me the ability to explain this passage in a way that everyone listening would, would be able to make adjustments in their life, would be able to, to use this information and this presentation as a, as a way to, to walk with you closer. Lord, I pray for those among us that are, are struggling in any way, emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially. Lord, I pray that you would help them. I pray that you would uh, just walk with them in the trials that we all go through. Lord, we lift up the Harvest Festival to you. Lord, I pray you'd fill up this property tomorrow night with people that are hungry for the Word of God, hungry for salvation, hungry for meaning in their life. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would draw people uh, to this property. Uh, Lord, I pray that, that, uh, that just for the kids, God, that are going to be here, Lord, 
help them to get their homework done early so the parents will let them come. And God, I just pray it would be a fantastic celebration, Lord, of light in, in, a, in a time that glorifies horror and spookiness and, and death and skeletons and witches and goblins. Lord, I pray that, that, uh, that, that your light would shine bright tomorrow night, Lord, that this place would be full of joy and passion and laughter and salvation, God. Thank you for all the volunteers, Lord. Uh, give them the, every, all, all the wisdom and the strength that they need uh, to uh, finish this race that we're in for this Harvest Festival, Lord. And God, we pray for the election, Lord. Uh, just less than two weeks away, God, we ask you that you would raise up leaders in our state and country that love you, that are committed to uh, morality and not immorality. Lord, we pray that, that, uh, that evil would be pushed back and that righteousness, Lord, your word says righteousness exalts a nation. We pray that the United States and Arizona would be a beacon of righteousness, Lord, that you would raise up courageous leaders that would say no. Uh, to, um, to things that are literally destroying people's lives, God. Uh, so we, uh, we seek you, Lord. We, we desperately ask you to move in our land, Lord. Lord, we, we desperately need this. Lord, we, 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 oh God, have mercy on us, God, we pray. Lord, as we turn our attention to your word, I pray you'd speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. The thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. Have you heard those words? Every Saturday, maybe not every Saturday, but when I was a kid growing up, oftentimes my dad would on Saturday turn on, uh, I think it was ABC, Wide World of Sports. And you, know, you see this, this entry, uh, the, you know, the introduction. And I just, in, in my mind, I remember, I watched the clip last night, actually, to refresh my memory. This skier coming down, you know what I'm talking about? The skier coming down the slopes. And, uh, and, and he loses his balance, and he just goes rough and tumble, and he must have broken several bones. But I don't know if that just warped my mind as a kid watching this every week. That was the agony of defeat. But the other part of this is the thrill of victory, and who doesn't like to win? I mean, winning is fantastic. Winning is great. Think of Olympic athletes that train their entire lives, get up early. They, they watch their diet meticulously. And they, they compete with all of their heart. Why? Well, even for many of them, even making it to the Olympics is a victory, overcoming so, so much adversity. But then getting the, the bronze or the silver or the gold medal, victory. We all like to win. There's a sweetness in it. In fact, if you're a coach, especially in a major league sport, see how long you'll remain a coach if you don't win. If, if, you're, if, you're just, if you just you know, go into that locker room and say, hey, guys, don't worry about winning. We're just here to have fun. You know, you're not, you're not going to have a job for very long. I mean, even, even my kids' coaches in sports, if, if they show up and say, and say, hey, guys, don't worry about winning. We're just, you know, just going to have fun, and you're going to learn good sportsmanship and all the rest. Now, that, may, that might be sort of appropriate, but I think the kids would respond, coach, it's fun to win. <laughs> You want us to have fun, let's win, because winning is fun. There's a thrill of victory. Life in the Spirit brings with it victory. And I'm not talking about being victorious at sports necessarily. I'm not talking about maybe being victorious that you're going to win that business deal necessarily. Although I believe as a Christian, honestly, I believe you have a better chance at, at you know, success in life. Uh, because of how you live your life. But what I'm talking about is victory in, are you ready? Suffering. Victory in suffering. Also going to talk about victory in prayer. And then when we get to Romans 8.28, we'll talk about victory in all circumstances. All right, so let's take a look at this. Victory in suffering. Victory in suffering. I did not say victory over suffering. Um, I did not say that this means that we will not suffer, although there is a faction within uh, Christendom that says if you are a Christian, you have enough faith, you will be healed, you will be financially prosperous, 
uh, and that is heresy. That's wrong. That's false teaching. And if you're in any type of circles that, that propagate that, you need to get out of those and not let that affect you. Uh, if, if you believe as a Christian you do not suffer, you do not know your Bible. You do not know your Bible. Uh, there's entire churches that teach this. In fact, I used to live in Miami, and uh, when I was driving to my uh, girlfriend, now wife's house, I'd drive by a church that it was a Spanish church, and it's, I, I believe the name of it was Para de Sufrir, which in Spanish means stop suffering. This was the name of the church, like Calvary Chapel, right? The name of our church is No Suffering, right? Stop Suffering. And I've nev never went to that church, but I imagine that the gospel that they're preaching is really not the gospel, that the gospel that they're preaching is one of, if you have enough faith, you shouldn't suffer. This is an abomination, brothers and sisters. Some of you know this well because you're in it. You're in it, and your faith is being refined, and, and your, your, your heart is being strengthened as Christ is walking with you and as we, the church, are walking with you through suffering. And so when I say victory in suffering, I'm not talking about avoiding suffering. I'm talking about having victory in suffering. Look at verse 18. It says, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory <laughs> that will be revealed in us. Understand, all suffering is temporary. You are an eternal creature. As I, as I look at you, you are going to live forever if you're a Christian here today. You're going to be in a place where there's no such thing as suffering. You're going to experience glory that's going to go on and on and on and on and on and on. And just like from Narnia, as they went back into that uh, wardrobe, when they saw that lamppost, it's like, oh, that lamppost looks kind of, wait, what, what? And, and, and it's like this life that we're living now, I think when we're in heaven, we'll be like, wait a minute, earth, like 2022? Oh, I kind of remember that. Because it's going to be so glorious, so unspeakably awesome that you're suffering now, no big deal. And I'm not minimizing your suffering, don't get me wrong. I, I'm, I'm, I love you and I'm with you. But in light of eternity, your suffering is light. You're never going to die. You're never going to die. In fact, um, there was a, a song that came out a number of years ago called If You Could See Me Now. And uh, I just want to read these lyrics because this is what somebody in heaven now would be saying. You know, I, I mean, some of you have watched people pass into eternity in pain and, and in tragedy. And, and, and they're suffering for, you know, sometimes years. This is what a person in heaven would say. Our prayers have all been answered. I finally arrived. The healing that had been delayed has now been realized. No one's in a hurry. There's no schedule to keep. We're all enjoying Jesus just sitting at his feet. If you could see me now, I'm walking streets of gold. If you could see me now, I'm standing tall and whole. If you could see me now, you know, you'd know I've seen his face. If you could see me now, you'd know the pains erased. You wouldn't want me to ever leave this place. My light and temporary trials have worked out for my good. To know it brought him glory when I misunderstood. Though we've had our sorrows, they can never compare what Jesus has in store for us. No language can share. You're going to make it. You're going to get there. So, what do we do in the meantime? Well, first we understand, as verse 19 to 22 tells us, that even creation is suffering. Did you know that? Even creation is suffering. In fact, the tree in my front yard, when I walk by it, it groans. It's like, oh, oh, come on, Pat, please do something about me. And I need to replace this tree. But, so, but our, our creation is groaning. Because it too is waiting for a glorious future. Isaiah 65, 17 says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. 2 Peter 3, 13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. 
can't wait for an earth in which righteousness dwells. Creation is glorious. You know, we have Arizona sunsets. And if you live in a place where you can see the sunset, um, we used to, I used to be able to look out my window and see the mountains and the sunrise because on the side of the house. But then they built all these houses there now. And now I just see houses. But if you're in a place where you can actually, you know, have desert and you see, it's just glorious, isn't it? You know, the, the, the reds and the yellows and the oranges. I mean, the whole sky turns orange and yellow. It's just absolutely beautiful. And this is a fallen world. This is a cursed world, and it's so beautiful. Imagine what an uncursed, glorious world will look like. Amazing, isn't it? We do live in a cursed world. Genesis chapter 3 is when the curse began, but the curse will be lifted. All right, so all creation is groaning, waiting for glory. We are groaning, waiting for glory. But, but we have this this um, deposit that has been given to us to guarantee glory. It's called the Holy Spirit. Uh, verse 23 calls the Holy Spirit a foretaste of future glory. I mean, what is heaven going to be like? What is glory going to be like? And I believe one of the best remedies for suffering is to think about glory, to think about the future, to set your mind and heart on things above, not on earthly things. And as we talk about life in the Spirit and this Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God that dwells within us, this, this foretaste of future glory. Have you ever been praying and someone comes to mind? Well, that might be the Holy Spirit telling you to pray for that person. Or maybe you've been praying about a problem. This has happened to me on numerous times, praying about a situation, praying about a problem. Then all of a sudden an idea pops into your mind. Well, where do you think that idea came from? It's probably the Lord, right? It's the Lord telling you, hey, why don't you try this? Why don't you do this? I mean, this is absolutely beautiful to walk a spirit-led life, to live a spirit-filled life. This is what God wants for each and every one of us. And so this week, I want all of you to, to just be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I mean, as you go home, maybe the Holy Spirit might put upon your heart, why don't I vacuum the house so my wife doesn't have to do it? <laughs> You know, that, that could be the Holy Spirit speaking t through me right now to you, right? And the wives are like, right on, pastor. We're going to keep coming to this church. Be led by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit can lead you in a, in a number of ways. It's always going to be biblical, right? God's never going to lead you to do something that, that, con that is contrary to his word. Um, all right, so, so as we think about suffering, and I know some of you are just going through very tough times, very difficult times. Um, these verses talk about our posture, which should be one of eager, hopeful waiting. Eager, hopeful waiting. We know we've got glory, but this world is rough and tough. So what do we do? Well, we wait and we persevere. It's not, it's not too profound here. We, we continue to endure. We continue to go through it. And this is... This is uh, um, uh, what 2 Corinthians 4, 16, 17 says, we don't lose heart. We don't lose heart. It's easy to lose heart, isn't it? Sometimes we go through suffering, and I've, I've been through suffering, and there, there's, there's this aspect of it that, like, what did I do wrong? We sometimes have this idea when this big trial comes, that, like, I must have done something wrong. God must not be pleased with me because this suffering's coming into my life. And that's the, the theological term for that is stinking thinking. <laughs> All right? So, so, so we can't think that we've done something wrong, and so suffering happens. Now listen, if you come to me and say, Pastor, I'm going through such a tough time. I'm going through so much suffering. And I say, well, tell me, what, what happened? And you say, well, you know, I, I broke into this convenience store, and I, I stole all the money, and now the cops are, like, constantly harassing me. And, and I'm like, dude, okay. <laughs> That's not suffering. That's consequence. Well, maybe it is suffering, but that's consequences for your stupidity. All right. So when I say, you know, that you know God's working this suffering out in your life, I, I'm, you know, I'm talking about suffering that is not the result of your of sinful choices. Now, listen. Sometimes these sinful choices, and we'll get into this a bit later, but sometimes these sinful choices, God is using that in your life to get you to a to a to a certain place. Anyhow, 2 Corinthians 4, 16, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, 
yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. All right, so let's think about what we've learned. Suffering, we need to keep in mind our future glory. Uh, we groan, right? I know some of you, when you get out of bed, before you get out of bed, I should say, you're groaning <coughs> until your feet hit the floor and your body kind of snaps into place, right? And then, and then and you know, so we're groaning, but what do we do? Well, we've got the Holy Spirit, so that's our guarantee. That's this foretaste of glory, this spirit-led life. And we don't lose heart. We eagerly wait and hope as we persevere. All right? So that's suffering. We have victory. This is victory. This is victory and suffering. If you're not a Christian, none of that makes any sense to you. Right? Because only Christians can have this type of attitude and victory and suffering. All right. So let's move on. Number two. This chapter teaches that we have victory in prayer. Look at verse 26. It says, And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. So true or false, there are times that we feel weak in prayer. True, right? Sometimes we find it difficult to pray. Absolutely. Sometimes we, we have a hard time praying. Sometimes suffering brings us on. I mean, suffering can, can drive us to prayer, right? That's the right response to suffering. But sometimes our hearts can be a little bit hardened. And I said, I'm not going to pray because I'm suffering. What do we have to help us? Well, we have the church. Hopefully you're in a 242 group. So you have some, some good people that know you well. Um, you have the scriptures, of course, that help you. But this Bible says that we also have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. And when we feel weak in prayer, we don't know what to pray. We don't know what to say. We have a hard time even starting to pray. Or we say the, we may be thinking we're saying the wrong things. Maybe we pray for things that aren't good for us. But this all goes through a Holy Spirit filter. It all goes through a Holy Spirit spirit filter so even if you're praying the wrong thing or it's you know god i pray that i marry this person and the lord's saying oy vey no <laughs> you know it goes through a holy spirit filter and the holy spirit says father don't listen to that prayer let me pray this is what your will is for that for that person isn't that beautiful that's victory that's victory in prayer you know you can even pray without words I mean, sometimes, especially in times of crisis, especially in times of, of, of just, you know, faced with the worst news that you've ever heard, and, and all you can do is groan, honestly, and you're just like, oh, my God. Maybe all you can say, God, please, Lord, and you don't even know what to say, right? And the Holy Spirit prays for you. The Holy Spirit prays for you. This is, this is so beautiful that, that we are not left to our own as it relates to prayer. You know, our relationship with Jesus is not like, okay, whoever prays really well is going to get five stars in heaven. It's not, it's not like that, right? It's just, you just pray. We all have victory in prayer. And what's interesting, and, and we'll get into this verse more next week, but if you just glance down right now in verse 34 of Romans chapter 8, who else is praying for us? What does verse 34 says? Who's praying for us? Jesus. Well, what is that? I mean, Jesus is praying for us. And then Hebrews 7.25 has another verse that says Jesus is praying for us. Here it says, he always lives to make intercession for them. Hebrews 7.25. Jesus is making intercession for us. The Spirit is praying. You know, two-thirds of the Trinity are praying for you, right? I mean, they're praying to God the Father for I mean, this is just, how can you lose if the Holy Spirit and Jesus are praying for you? Maybe we should start praying <laughs> as well, right? Maybe we should uh, just up our prayer life a little bit. And so in spite of whatever weakness that you feel or that you have, just rest assured, you know, you have victory in prayer. All right, so we talked about victory in suffering. We talked about victory in prayer. We're going to spend the rest of our time uh, talking about victory in all circumstances. Victory in all circumstances. Uh, we'll pick it up in verse 28 very famous verse here uh, in the entire Bible. This is one verse that, that uh, 
Uh, besides John 3.16, it's one of the first verses that people often go to. Uh, and it says here, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Then verse 29, it says, for God knew his people in advance. He chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Verse 30, and having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about verse 28 in a, in a minute, but I just want to think with you about verses 29 and 30, and I've just summarized those verses by saying this. You are chosen to become like Jesus. This is God's will for you. You want to know what God's will is? It's uh, to become like Jesus, Christ-likeness. Are you Christ-like? Well, you should be journeying toward Christ-likeness. I mean, this is beautiful, right? A community of several hundred people, and we're all journeying towards the same thing. We want to be like Jesus. We want to be like Jesus. Um, this is God's plan for us. And so this is, this is a good measure of, of our character as you think about your holiness, as you think about the things that come out of your mouth, the things that you think about, the person that you're becoming. Jesus is the goal. It's more Christ-likeness. All right, so let's, let's, uh, let's take a look at, at this verse here, 28. It says, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I mean, this is something that I've heard for, for many, many years in my life. Uh, and, and if you just think about that, this means that every decision that you've made, that I've made, every failure, uh, mistakes that you make, you think I should have done this, but I did that, you know, that God takes all of this and he works it out for good. Um, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. And uh, um, in, in a minute, I'm going to talk about some different views within the body of Christ and how they interpret this verse. But, but just, just to want to share a little illustration with you that I've heard that, that has been a little bit helpful in terms of how we interpret events in our lives. So there was an old farmer who was very poor but very wise. He had only one horse. And one day this horse ran away, and so all the villagers came to him and they expressed their sympathy. We're sorry your horse ran away. And he said, well, don't say that this was a bad thing. Maybe this is what God wanted. And they were kind of confused, the villagers were. Well, not too long after that, about a month later, this horse came back bringing with it two wild stallions, very beautiful horses. The villagers came to him and said, look at your great fortune. He said, ah, don't say that this is a good fortune. We don't, we don't know what God has in all of this. Well, his son, his only son, uh, loved to ride horses. And so one day his son jumped on one of these wild stallions. He was thrown off, broke his hip, broke his leg, became lame from birth, or he became uh, lame for the rest of his life. So the villagers came to console him, and they expressed their sympathy, and they said, we're really sorry that this incredible crisis have, has fallen to you. Your, your only son, your precious son, is now, is now lame. And the wise farmer said, listen, don't say that this is a bad thing. We don't know what God has for this. Well, a short time later, war broke out in their community, and all of the young men were drafted into battle, except the farmer's son. And all of, all of the other young men, most of them at least, died. And so the villagers came to him and, uh, and didn't say anything. And they just sat together. Since it's not necessarily a Christian worldview in that story, but, but the point is, all things work together for good. Right to those who love the Lord. And this should give us confidence. This should kind of take a little bit of pressure off our decisions. Um, now, I want to give a, a caution here because oftentimes this uh, improperly used could be a bit of a cliche response to somebody that's going through a tough time. You know, your, the spouse just leaves them and you go or, or I go and say, hey, don't, you know, don't worry, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That's not the right response. You know, that's not the right response. When a tragedy happens, a crisis happens, you just go and you sit with somebody. It's called the ministry of presence. You just be there. You weep with those who weep and you laugh with those who laugh. So th this is this verse, Romans 8, 28, while it is, uh, brings a lot of comfort, into our lives. Uh, it is also a favorite verse of, of some people that, uh, that have a certain view of God's uh, sovereignty and of God's working within the world. So what I want to do uh, is outline uh, for you three different views that exist today in the body of Christ that have to do with providence. 
And when I say providence, we're talking about how God, um, how God orchestrates the world, okay? So the first view uh, is called meticulous providence, meticulous providence. And so this view, uh, the, the key word, and with each of these views, I'll give you a, a key word, um, w- and we'll talk about, with each view, we'll talk about their view of sovereignty, um, and we'll talk about uh, choices that people make. And, and this is really important as we think about the problem of evil as well. So hopefully this will be helpful, helpful for you. Um, all right, so, so with meticulous providence, the key word is script. Think a script for a movie. Uh, and so a person who believes in, in uh, meticulous providence, and by the way, most um, five-point Calvinists would fall into, into, uh, into this category. And I'm going to try to do my best. And with each of these, just understand, with each of these, there's mystery with how God works, and, and there's, there's strengths and weaknesses, right, in each, in each view. Okay, so think of a script. In other words, God has a written plan uh, where he controls every detail of history. Um, so for example, let's just say you're watching whatever your favorite movie is or favorite TV show. Say somebody's going to open a door and you know, behind that door, there's somebody's waiting there to just knock them, knock them out. Right. And so you're watching, you're on the edge of your seat and they're, they're going to open the door and you're like, no, 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 don't open the door. Don't open the door. Now they have a choice. Do they have a choice to open the door? No, they don't because it's written in the script. They have to open the door. The author, the writer, put it in the script, all right? So, so, so the point is the only choice you can make is the choice that God wants you to make and the choice that God determines you will make. Um, and so, so the, for a meticulous providence uh, Christian, their view of sovereignty is that God controls every detail. I read a book when I was in college. Uh, I believe the title of the book was called The Sovereignty of God, if I'm not mistaken, and it was written by A.W. Pink. And it just, it just kind of caused my brain to explode because it was, it was talking, and it was meticulous providence talking about this view. By the way, this is not the view that I hold, just so you know. But I have lots of friends that hold this view, so I'm not, I'm not the, the one to speak bad about it in any way. And so the view of the world for a person who believes in meticulous providence is that this is the best possible world for God's glory. Like when you look at how evil exists in our world, they would say that this is the best possible world for God's glory. Okay, so the next view we'll talk about is active providence. Active providence, uh, and this is the view that I hold, uh, active providence, instead of a script, think of a ship. So God to history is as a captain to a ship. Um, and, and so that ship is going to the exact destination that, that the captain wants. However, there's a mutiny going on on the ship, right? So Satan is trying to take over. And uh, he's not going to win. Uh, and, and all those that are trying, on, are trying to uh, advance this mutiny, eventually they're going to get hung. Right when they get to destination, that's that's what would happen. All right, so so how does a person that believes in active providence uh, think about God's sovereignty? Well, they would say that God's purpose cannot be overcome. All right, so you see the difference. God controls every detail versus God's purpose cannot be overcome. And then, as it relates to choices, the way that a, a person who believes in active providence would would talk about human choice is that God has a plan, but people have options. So you can do whatever you want within the limits of the ship. Uh, so if you were on probably not a battleship because everybody has their assignments, but maybe on a cruise ship, right, you can get up. You can decide, well, I'm going to eat breakfast. Then you can say, I'm going to eat breakfast again. <laughs> and you can just, you know, you can go to the pool. Uh, you know, but if you try, you know, beating up another passenger, there's going to be some limits and you're going you're gonna to get punished uh, within, within that ship. And so we would say that, that then this would be limited contrary choice, if you want the theological term for that, right? So in other words, there, there, there are some choices you can make, but they're, they're, they're limited within the confines of, of God's plan. Okay, and the view of the world for the person that believes in active providence, um, it's not, the view would not be, so what it was for meticulous providence is that this is the best possible world for God's glory. The active providence Christian would say, well, this is a broken world, but God is still working for his glory. All right, so there's a bit of a difference there, okay? 
All right, and then the last view we'll talk about, uh, this would be the view of many Arminians. Um, and this is the, called free will providence, free will providence. Okay, so a person who believes in free will providence, the key word here we'll talk about here is king. So God is to history not necessarily a captain of a ship, but as the king over his subjects. And so the, the view of sovereignty would be uh, very similar to active providence, and that is that God's plans and purposes cannot be overcome. So God's plans and purposes cannot be overcome, and their view of the world is very similar. This is a broken world where God is working for his glory. But their view of choice is slightly different, slightly different, and that is that you can do whatever you want. And to a great extent, you determine your own future. Uh, and so the difference between this and meticulous providence is that God has already decreed. That's a, that's a, a big word for a, um, a Calvinist is decreed, God's decree. So God has already decreed all of your choices. But here for free will providence to say that, that God has not decreed all your choices. He knows all your choices. Everybody believes that God, in God's foreknowledge that he knows what you're going to choose. He knows what you're going to do. But in free will providence, God hasn't decreed it. He hasn't planned it. But he knows what you will choose. All right, so you see there's a slight difference there. Uh, and God will occasionally intervene, um, but never for sal salvation is what a free will providence person would say. All right, so those are, those are three uh, views mostly. And there's, of course, many nuances within, within those views. Uh, but what I'd like to talk about here is, is, is how this really plays out when you come to a verse like Romans 8.28 that says, God causes everything to work together, or all things work together for the good you know, of, God's, of God's people. Uh, let's just take a, a very uh, real situation, and this is, and this is a, an actual situation that I'm going to tell you about. So there were two missionary young ladies that were serving in a Middle Eastern country. I don't know what country it was. And, uh, and they were told never to open their door uh, when a random person knocks on the door. Uh, and so they're in their apartment, and uh, they hear a knock on the door. One of them looks through the little people, and they see a person in great need outside that door. And, uh, and so just like you and I that would have compassion on a person in need, they decide against their, uh, their orders to open this door and there were people outside the view of the people who then came in and ambushed and ended up beating up both of these, both of these girls. And, uh, and so they ended up coming back to, coming back, coming home, back to the U.S. And they, they went to their respective home, uh, you know, their respective homes. I think one was from Minnesota and I think one was from Oregon. I don't, that's not relative to the story. But what is relative is that, is that they did get counseling. Obviously, right? Uh, one of them was counseled, if I'm not mistaken, and I may have this incorrect, but just for purpose of illustration, just go with it here. One of them was counseled by a person who believes in meticulous providence. One of them was counseled by a person that believes in active providence. And so how would a meticulous providence person counsel a person who was a victim of horrendous evil, right? Remember, meticulous providence... Uh, God's will, right? God has decreed everything as a script. And so the counsel then to somebody that's gone through horrific evil is that this was evil, uh, it's part of, but it's part of God's plan. And some way, somehow, God will bring good out of it. Okay? All right. How would an active providence person counsel a girl like that? Let's say... This is absolutely horrendous evil. This does not please the Lord. God did not desire this. <laughs> All right. Um, God, God did not desire this for you. Right? God loves you, and, and, and the people that did this are evil, etc. Right? So there's a difference that really plays out in how you view the world with how you respond to evil with how you counsel people. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, if I'm remembering the story correctly, uh, the, the person that received the counsel of, hey, this is all part of God's plan, and, uh, and God will work it out for good. If I'm not mistaken, I believe that she 
basically said, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to follow a God like that. I'm not going to worship a God like that. Right. Um, not, not the case in the other lady. Listen, my intention today is not to talk bad about any, any group within the body of Christ. And I'm well aware at a church like this, we are home to many recovering Calvinists, <laughs> if I could say it that way. Uh, please don't, please don't throw anything at me. Um, and, and recovering Arminians, right? And, and my challenge would be like, let's not put God in a theological system, all right? Let's allow space for mystery. The best way I've heard this explained is that the sovereignty of God and the free will of man are two parallel lines that only meet in the heart of God, okay? So be very careful about saying, I'm this or I'm that. What we should do, though, I mean, it's okay to have a position, but I think what we, what the, the best way to arrive at what position you have is to say which position accounts for most of the biblical material that I can read. Does that make sense? Okay, so my concern today is opening this up for questions. <laughs> I think I regretted that at the first service. All right, let me see here what I want to say next. All right, just want to underscore Every Christian, if you know, every biblical Christian, when I say Christian, I'm not talking about liberal wackos that call themselves Christians and they're really not. I'm talking about people who are truly saved, right? Every Christian believes, uh, I probably shouldn't call people wackos, I'm sorry, but every, every Christian believes in God's sovereignty. Every Christian believes in God's purpose, God's plan. Every Christian believes all things work together for good to those who love God. It's just how you bring all of the teaching of the Bible together. All right, so to end, to conclude, I'm going to talk about George Bailey. You guys know who George Bailey is? Yeah. It's a wonderful life, right? Remember uh, that movie, probably be, sh be uh, appropriate here to start watching in another month or so, but uh, it's a great, fantastic movie. Um, although, when a bell rings, it doesn't mean that angels get their wings. <laughs> all right? All right, I hate to ruin it for you. I hate to ruin it for you. Um, and I hope and pray that angels are really not like Clarence. <laughs> okay, so, so, but nonetheless, it's kind of a fun movie to watch. And so, so what happens here for those of you, does anybody have never seen this movie? Probably not, but for those of you who, who maybe have never seen this movie, uh, so this, this man, George Bailey, goes through some hard times and he, and, uh, and he utters the phrase, I wish I'd never had been born. So the angel hears this phrase, and the angel's trying to earn his wings, right, which is not biblical. But, but then the, the, angel, the angel gets an idea and says, well, let me show him his life as if he'd never been born. And, uh, and so, so he realizes that uh, when, be, because of his life, he rescued his brother from an icy pond. And his brother went on to be a war hero, saved many other soldiers. And if George hadn't been there, his brother would have died, right? Uh, another, another event that happened in his life, he was able to stop the pharmacist. Remember that scene? He's able to stop the pharmacist from putting poison into, uh, into some tablets that, that, uh, that then he ended up going to jail for, for like, or prison for 20 years, but George saved him from that. So these other people's lives were better because of the life of George Bailey. Um, and so his life was a blessing to others. Everything worked out for good. All things work together for good. So as someone with whom the Spirit dwells, you, you have victory in suffering because your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you will also appear with him in glory. So what's a little suffering now in light of this eternal glory that awaits you? As a Christian, as someone with whom the Spirit dwells, you have victory in prayer. Because when you don't know what to pray, the Spirit intercedes for you. He's always praying for you in accordance with the will of God. And as a Christian, as someone with whom the Spirit dwells, you have victory in all circumstances because God is sovereign. And His plan is moving forward. He is on the throne. And all things in your life are working out for good 
because you are called according to his purpose. And so this sermon isn't a lot of go do this and go do that. This sermon is, man, recognize that as a Christian with whom the Spirit dwells, you are victorious. You are victorious. 